Hello and welcome to Talk Spooky to Me, the Ghost Story Guys Mail Show. I'm Brennan Storr. I'm Paul Bestall. And this is our chance to hear from you, our audience. Paul, my friend, how are you doing? I'm very well. I've finally managed to get some sleep after scaring myself for most of the week. And I assume you were scaring yourself not by reading the newspaper, uh, but by watching serial killer documentaries. Yes, about unsolved serial killers, which I didn't realize there were so many of and makes me glad I live in England. Yeah, you, you have you have drawn me into watching this show. So when I uh, when I cannot sleep over the next week, I'll be sending you the therapy bills. It lulls you into a false sense of security because it, it sort of starts talking about some some very old ones. And then the next thing you know, you're talking about things in recent history and you think, what? How do I not know about this? I've said it before, man. Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> oh, well. Live and learn. Or, or not, depending. <laughs> I'm sure I'll do it all again when Files of the Unexplained drops on Netflix next month, and I'm sure one of those episodes will probably scare me as well. Yes, yes. We're going to be talking about that on our next live show in April, the one we do for patrons at $10 and above. We're going to be going through some of those episodes. I'm really looking forward to that. On this episode, however, we do not have tales of serial killers. We don't even have email on this episode, actually, because... We have very special guests, and that conversation is going to take up most of the episode. We are honored to have on this show Derek Hayes and David Flora, hosts, of course, of Monsters Among Us and Blurry Photos, respectively, here to talk about their brand new documentary, Shadows in the Desert, High Strangeness in the Borrego Triangle. And uh, we had a really, really great time talking with these guys. I'd been invited to take part in a live stream with Derek about four years ago. Uh, but we didn't ha- talk much directly. It was kind of part of a round table and you had, uh, you'd had him on your show a few years ago now. Yeah. It was around the same time. Oh, there we go. Yeah. When, when we were all bored at the beginning of the pandemic <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in the old times. Uh, but this was, this was my first time talking to David Flora and again, they were both great dudes. Uh, yes, I really, great company. really enjoyed the conversation. So again, no email on this episode. That will be next time around. Although we do have a a special treat and that is a a, a different kind of guest. So we were recently invited to take part in a screening of Late Night with the Devil in (laughs) London. I know, I know. (laughs) And and because it was in London and not the London I live in, the good London, we could not go. So we thought, well, we might have to miss out on this opportunity, but as it turns out, we do know someone in London who can go for us. Someone who is in fact even nerdier when it comes to horror movies than even me and Paul. And that is an achievement. Let me tell you, that someone is Canel. Canel is a battle rapper and podcast host. His show is Canel's Sinister Cinema. And Canel went in our stead and joins us now with a special report. Hey, what's good? It's me, Mr. Always Had a Buzz of Every Rhyme I Wrote, and everybody want to know me like the Wi-Fi code, Kinell himself, reporting live for the Ghost Story Guys. I am just leaving London now on a train which is having more announcements per minute than any train I've ever been on in my life. But it's one of those, like, I'm coming out of London, couldn't really find anywhere to record something, so we're doing it on the train, it is what it is. But yeah, I'm leaving now because I've just been watching Late Night with the Devil, just got out of press screening for that, and I've been very excited to watch watched this film for quite some time. It was doing bits on the festival circuit last year and I managed to miss it at every single festival I go to. Every festival, there's always that one, that one film that everyone is all about. And I always managed to miss it because I'm in the pub arguing with someone why Scanners 3, The Takeover, is the best Scanners film, which it is. And I'm always right, but I always miss the film. And the one that everyone was hyping last year was Late Night with the Devil. So I finally got to see it right now, and I've got to say, it really appealed to me on a lot of levels. It concerns a live television broadcast in 1977. Yeah, a lot going on around that time. Sort of like Late Night, Johnny Carson kind of thing, you know, uh, before James. Jay Leno was Jay Leno, all of them ones, and the host of it, uh, played by David Darrell Malkin, I don't know if that's how you pronounce his name, but I'm going to go with it anyway, he's like a, he's always been like the, the, the runner up, he's not been the guy, so he's been trying to do more things with his show. Uh, in the in the times leading up to this live broadcast, and it's their Halloween broadcast, and they're trying to like bring in occult things. They've got uh, someone who de- debunks things. They've got someone who's written a book 
about, uh, what should we call it, possessions. They've got someone who claims to be possessed. They've got a psychic, a, 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 a mind reader, a, might be a cold reader. There's a lot about that kind of at the start. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost a cliche for uh, someone who's British to bring up Ghost Watch when it's found footage, mockumentary type tour. But Ghost Watch is very applicable here. Like primarily because of the uh, sort of the, the content of the live broadcast, but also like the vibe, the retro vibe, you know, it's like, it's set in the 70s and they've absolutely nailed the aesthetic. I love it. The yellows, the browns, the haircuts, the outfits really appeal to me on a bunch of levels. You know, we got uh, lots of references to like, stuff that most people will be familiar with like Ed and Lorraine Warren and Amityville and all that kind of thing and uh, also a few the, there's also a bit of set up in the law that uh, th th there's elements of it that I think uh, like ghost story guys viewers might be a bit more familiar with than your average person like uh, this guy the uh, host he's, he, he's uh, involved with something called the Grove which is not so subtly based on Bohemian Grove uh, all that kind of thing. Names have been changed uh, and some details to protect the shadow government that are making all the decisions for us and all that kind of thing. There's references to the Davidian cult and uh, Waco, all that kind of thing. There's uh, uh, like, uh, like references to the satanic panic, all this and like it's all in the setup. And I got a lot of time for it because that's all the stuff I can like listen to people going on about all day. But during this, uh, I'd say it's like a more more light-hearted than a sort of ghost watch kind of things. But like, it's one of those. It's a horror comedy that doesn't fall over into slapstick. We're not into scary movies. We're we're, we're into we're not into scary movie territory. We're not here into repossessed. We're into something that's actually got a bit of meat to it. And the scares are done well, and the effects are done particularly well, and the performances are fantastic. The, the like we get a lot of these we get a lot of uh, uh, possession themed horrors uh, exorcism themed horrors uh, like and uh, like most of them are just repeating the formula that we are oh so familiar with since the exorcist did it first did it so good everyone just followed it since so I always appreciate when there's other elements to it or something else going on like uh, the performance of the girl Lily was particularly good at this I like the subtle things she was doing before it goes all like before they go straight to the freaky looking girl your mother sucks cocks in hell all that kind of thing like you know flipping we've seen these tropes we want something with a bit more meat to it and and this does quite a good job of like being like almost a character study of the host guy without actually really talking about what his background is it's a lot implied there's a lot of hints and things come out through exposition it's a it's a it's a lot of letting you figure things out for yourself which i appreciate it's it's not like loads of figuring things out for yourself uh, like you know it's not something you have to decode but they're not explicit with it and, and like I've got a lot of time for it I believe the filmmakers of this are Australian like and uh, you know the Australians are doing bits obviously we had talk to me last year and like apparently like flipping the Australians can definitely be trusted with doing possession themed horror in a way that's a bit more subtle than uh, than their American counterparts should we say but yeah uh, so as I say, I'm going to wrap this up because there's definitely going to be another train announcement soon. I might get home and find out this has got so much background noise I need to record it again anyway. But nonetheless, we always try and put that little bit of effort in. But yeah, I mean, based off the theory that if it's not a five-star film, what would you change about it? I'm going to say I've got to call this a five-star film because I wouldn't change anything about it. I mean... Yeah, flipping. This would have been a top five film of last year for me if I'd have actually seen it last year, but I didn't. I know, nonetheless. Kin L K S E podcast. Big up the ghost story, guys. Safe. All right. So again, that was that was Kinell. He is the host of <laughs> Sinister Cinema on YouTube, which is both an audio podcast and he does a full video package. It's it's really impressive. It's a ton of work, and I think his new studio. Is, uh, is either in place or it's going to be in place pretty soon. But uh, great dude, very funny. And as you heard from his reference of Scanners 3, 
extraordinarily <laughs> nerdy. He fits right in. If we have further opportunities for screenings in London, Canal will be our, our man on the ground. And again, if you, if you like what his presence there, because that was 100% pure unfiltered Canal, you should check out Sinister Cinema. Again, I, I met him, geez, I met him about three years ago now. And we've sort of kept tangentially in touch. Ge- genuinely, I think he's one of the funniest people I know. I follow him on Letterboxd and I just, his reviews slay me. It's always one or two lines, uh, but he always manages to find something very, very funny to say. And honestly, some of his rap, bat- actually a lot of his rap battles are on YouTube and they're worth watching. Even the ones where he loses, he's always just got something, something brilliant up his sleeve. He, he's quite the guy. So again, that was, that was Canel talking about Late Night with the Devil, which is in cinemas now. Uh, not just in the UK, as we thought. It is, in fact, available in cinemas in North America. And uh, there was another movie, Paul, I watched, which I was going to tell you mm-hmm. about. I've been on this sort of Eastern European sci-fi movie kick lately. I bought this box set from Vinegar Syndrome. It's called The Apocalypse Tetralogy, and it's four Polish post-apocalyptic sci-fi films from the 60s, uh, which were grim. And then I watched Under Gods, which was really interesting. And then I watched Restore Point. And the gist of Restore Point is essentially it, it's a future noir. So it's, it's set in this future world where people can save their consciousness, essentially like a save game, and can be restored as long as they have saved within the previous 48 hours. You cannot restore someone who has saved further back than 48 hours for reasons which are explained in the film. And two people, one of whom is very high up in the organization that does the restoring, are murdered, and they don't have backups. And the film sort of explores the the mystery from there. Now, I'll be honest with you, it's not wholly original. Like, the idea is kind of cool, uh, but the story itself is not exactly a surprise. You know, like, if you watched a detective movie, you know, you, you're not going to exactly yeah. be shocked about <laughs> where it goes. But it, that said, it's, it's worth a watch because it's, it's really pretty. They put a lot of effort into kind of developing this future world. I think it's set in 2041. It's from the Czech Republic. So you've got the, again, you've already got like the brutalist architecture, the kind of stone, the the mason work there. But then they've expanded upon it with CG to give you these very almost dread-like mega buildings and things like this. So again, it's not exactly an original film, but it is very engaging. And and I think it's it's worth folks' time. So yeah, if you want to watch Restore Point, I believe you can rent that now pretty much everywhere. And so should you find yourself in the mood for a, a mystery that's a little bit different than what's floating around on Netflix, I recommend checking it out. All right. Well, we have two guests waiting on the other side of this break, and so we will not make them wait anymore. Welcome back. Joining us tonight to talk about their brand new documentary, Shadows in the Desert, High Strangeness in the Borrego Triangle, are paranormal storytelling legends, David Flora, host of Blurry Photos, and Derek Hayes, host of Monsters Among Us. Gentlemen, welcome to the Ghost Story, guys. What's up, guys? How are you doing? Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. It's great to have you here. Again, uh, I was thrilled when you reached out about the film, and uh, especially to sit down and watch it, because good paranormal documentaries, I don't mind saying it, they are few and far between. And this very much qualifies as as a really great documentary. Well, we appreciate that. Thank you. We worked hard and a long time on it, so it better be good. <laughs> Four years, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, re- regardless of everything that's that's covered in the in the film, gents, I love things like this. Obviously, living in the UK, that I get to see these places that are so beautifully desolate, regardless of everything else, because I think. One of the things about these areas is some people can kind of just presume it's just desert and whatever. But when you look at it in the way that you guys have taken us around and some of the aerial shots and the topography of the area and the and the real sort of conflicts that you've got from how high some of the peaks are down to some of the below sea level areas that you've got, it just shows you just how large and rich an area that is. And it's it, it's beautiful. So it's it, it's no wonder there are strange things abound in such an area as this. And it's incredibly diverse too. You know, you have pine forest at like 8,000 feet and then down at sea level, it's a wasteland, 120 some degrees down there. I've got to say, man, one of the most frightening things in in the film was just the the on-screen temperatures. (laughs) (laughs) And those were as accurate as we could make them as well. You know, it it was hot. It was warm. Yeah. I went hiking down in Joshua Tree and Anza Borrego about 14 years ago. 
and I was unprepared. I, I was invited down by a friend who grew up in New Mexico, so he knew what to expect. He did not warn me. And uh, woof, <laughs> woof. <laughs> We actually put up a, a disclaimer at the first of the film just for yes. that, you know, um, and that was something that was, you know, we knew about. We were we tried to be prepared going out there. But when we started letting people watch little snippets here and there, they were like, do you have a disclaimer? Because people will go out there and they will die. So <laughs> tell them. And a lot of people do out there. You know, they, they walk out a mile into the desert thinking, oh, I'll just walk right back, and they just never make it back. I will never forget we were out there, and uh, again, my friend was familiar with the desert, so we walked quite a distance out, and we encountered an elderly couple who had gone out for a picnic and driven off the road into the sand. Well, as, as you guys know what happens when you drive off the road into the sand in a car. They'd been there hours. Uh, so we pushed them out, and I want to say about 15 minutes later, we were walking, and we came upon them again. We said, you stupid buggers, you, this is not, you, you know, this is not a, a recipe for longevity. Get back on the road. Yeah. You, you get one. After that, you... <laughs> Maybe they wanted it at that point. I don't... Yeah. <laughs> Who is this guy? We can't shake him. They were like, stop interfering. <laughs> is he some kind of saving ghost? This guardian angel will not leave us alone, I swear. <laughs> I am very pale, so it's not impossible. <laughs> <laughs> we got stuck once. We we um, we had a s smaller car in the in the um, caravan, um, and had to have uh, Sean, who's in the film. He had the right vehicle to pull us out, but yeah, you can't make it very far once you get off the highway. Yeah, and, and just so our our listeners have a sense of the area. The Borrego Triangle, the subject of the film, if I remember correctly, that stretches from Hemet down to the Mexican border in the south and then the Salton Sea in the That's east. Right. Is that correct? Yeah. That, roughly. I mean, you yeah, don't measure it out, but like, you know, roughly. Poles in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're saving that for the sequel. <laughs> what put you on to activity in the triangle? Well, I guess it started with me. Uh, my wife and I camp all over Southern California, all over California, really. And we kept going down to uh, Anza Borrego Desert State Park. And I would hear these stories that get calls into my show. I would hear things online about, you know, the strange activity going on down there. So one of the times we were visiting, I went to the bookstore and I thought, I'll get a book on the local paranormal lore, you know, of this area. Nothing like that existed. So I thought, oh, a documentary, surely, something like that. Nothing, absolutely nothing. So that's how it, that's how the idea kind of developed. Nothing existed. There was this area of high strangeness that no one's really covered. And then that kind of brewed for a while until David got involved. And then we really started getting rolling at that point. So you mentioned off air, but for, for our listeners, what was the total gestation length of the process? It was, it was quite lengthy. The idea uh, took hold in, I think, 2019. Um, we did our Kickstarter um video you know we did a little trailer for kickstarter went out there and i think it was october maybe early november i forget which of 2019 and then it was october yeah and then once kickstarter got funded that was like march what 12th or 11th or something of 2020 and and then oh boom, man the port cullis came down <laughs> it was lockdown day essentially yeah, yeah. Why, so what, did, what did something happen in march <laughs> yeah, 2020 yeah, yeah everybody know. just went crazy <laughs> 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 uh, well, it, it's strange because obviously listening to Derek's show at that time, and obviously Derek, when you guested on my show, like I say, almost four years ago now, you were you were really excited. You were looking forward to it, and we were talking about lockdown finishing, and and you yourself and David and the and the crew were going to get out there and and start doing it. So it's it's interesting that with the best laid plans, it's it's strange how sometimes life can throw you a curveball. I think none of us expected anything to be as extensive as it, as it was, because obviously here, it last lockdown over here, near enough lasted two and a half years. It was only sort of the summer of 2022, we could even get back to anything like it was before. So I can only imagine the frustrations you must have both felt at that point. It was over a year and a half, I think, that we had to just sit around and twiddle our thumbs, essentially waiting to get out there to shoot. We'd done as much research as we could. You know, we had all the crew uh, lined up. We just needed to get out there to the desert. The park was closed. You couldn't get an Airbnb for a long time. So it, it was just impossible for us to get out there. The second they started lifting things, we're like, we just got to take the chance and go. And thankfully we did. And, you know, I, I will say real quick that as much as it sucked to have all that time between when we announced it and when it finally came out, 
we used every second of that time. Uh, we we did dozens of passes over the edits. Uh, we had time to animate some of the art that we used. You know, there were some other witnesses that we kind of pulled in pulled in later in the in the process that that weren't there in the initial filming. That were like, oh, let's add this person in, and it kind of folded them into the story. So with that extra time, I feel like it really helped make the the picture what it is. Uh, of course, that does. Uh, it's not great that it takes four years to get a project done, but you know, films like this, sometimes that's just how it rolls. Yeah. And, and I want to say on the subject of the art, those little animated sequences were just perfection. That was, uh, our artist, Jonathan Dodd did the, um, the illustrations for it. And then Matt, our editor, uh, took those e- layer by layer and animated those. So it was very oh, painstaking wow. process. And that was, uh, all Matt for the animation and all Jonathan for the illustration. Well, again, it, it worked. Yeah, it, it really worked out. Coupled with some fantastic soundtrack as well, because as everybody probably realizes, apart from you, David, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for a synth riff at the best of times, and I just loved it going on you know, with the visuals as well. It just works perfectly, guys. We were looking for a certain vibe, and we certainly captured it somehow. I don't know how we did it, but we got it. Sometimes when you're, when you're doing magic, you don't necessarily know how you got there, just that you got there. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't matter how you got there as long as you reach that result, right? That's it. Before we dive into some of the phenomena in the area, I'm just very curious because I've heard so many different perspectives on kickstarting uh, projects. And I've, I've heard from, yes, Kickstarter is amazing, to boy, Kickstarter can be a real, real uh, difficult thing to manage. You know, specifically expectations. I know that there are some people who will, I've heard from some creators, rather there are investors who will, you know, they'll buy something for $20 and then in two weeks time, they want to know why it's not in their Netflix queue already. And was that much of an issue given the the production time? You know, I think people were, were pretty lenient as far, it, again, this is four years, you know, people paid for this stuff on Kickstarter and, and we're literally shipping it out right now in the room next, next to me here. It's just box city over there. So we're finally getting them out. But, you know, like I said, it's been four years. So Thankfully, people have understood, you know, there was a global pandemic in that time and, you know, this is our first film and all this stuff. But it is, uh, at, at least from my end, it is a little bit nerve wracking to keep track of all that stuff. You know, you're trying to make a film and then you also have all these promises that you made people, which is great. I, you know, I, I really uh, appreciate them fin- uh, funding the film and everything, but it, it is uh, kind of time to pay the piper, so to speak, at this point, because, you know, it's time to ship all this stuff out. And we made a, a committed a cardinal sin is what we did is we promised DVDs and we didn't realize that we weren't going to be able to get these DVDs until the film was released. So we could have shipped the stuff years ago, but we were waiting on this one element that we promised. And if we were to send it as a second shipment, you know, that would cost us thousands of dollars and kind of defeat the purpose of raising money to shoot the film. So to answer your question on my end, at least it, it's a lot of work. Uh, it's, it's a lot of, uh, dotting the I's, crossing the T's, that sort of thing. But uh, we do really appreciate, you know, everybody making this happen for us. Part of it was that since we were new to the process, um, we didn't actually know what we could and couldn't do, but we didn't know that we didn't know that, you know. And so we were just like, we want to give the everybody, you know, something good, something worthwhile for backing this, you know, T-shirts. Um, we, I think we even have sand from the area or something like it's, yeah, a little vial of sand. Yeah. Just little keepsakes and things like that. And then, uh, I think we promised, like Derek said, DVDs, digital copies, things like that. And we were like, and once we got into the actual, uh, talking to the dis- the distribution of it and that company that picked us up, uh, we found out that, you know what? Not all this stuff we can deliver on because of, uh, you know, terms and conditions and this and that and what they are allowing us to do. And so, yeah, it it was very much a learning process along with um, <laughs> putting this film together for four years. It's a long learning process. It was process. all a learning process. Every <laughs> Every square inch of what we did was a learning process. <laughs> Well, I mean, obviously, I know you, you were saying it's it, it was filmed over a sort of period of 13 days because you had that Airbnb as sort of your, your base camp that you would be venturing out from, gents. So I suppose when you look at what you've got, it's a remarkable result, really, that you were able to capture as much and travel as extensively as you did because you, you, you go from one end to the other near enough. Um, 
trying to pick out your favourite sort of hotspots in regards to the weird phenomena around there. So really, I suppose the filming, when you look back on it, those 13 days, even though you had some hellishly hot temperatures, that's probably when you when you balance it all up, that was probably the easiest part of the process then. You're not wrong. It, there was a lot of planning that was involved. And what we did basically is the, the, the triangle's huge. It's 1,600 square miles, I think, something like that. So to drive from one point to the other would take you three hours, possibly. So we really uh, focused on, oh, we're going to this corner. We're going to get everything in this corner. We don't want to have to come back to this area. So having all the, again, this time to plan all this out and kind of look at a, a strategy as to what's the fastest way to get all this stuff filmed without driving thousands of miles throughout the desert. And, you know, again, I, I credit the, the extra time we had that, that allowed us to do all that and get all that coverage. And our crew was amazing, too. I mean, there was no complaints, even though it was hotter than <laughs> the devil's butthole out there. <laughs> Going back to what you guys were uh, talking about before and how as soon as um, the COVID restrictions were lifted and we could get out there, it was July, I think, June, July of 21, I think. And so we were like, we got to get this thing going. Let's just go for it. I don't know if that was a smart decision in retrospect, but we did it. <laughs> <laughs> we thought we'd suffer for everyone's uh, entertainment. Is it really art if you've not suffered? <laughs> What's a quick trip to the surface of the sun among friends? <laughs> <laughs> What's a little shared heat stroke, you know? <laughs> yeah. I have to take my hats off because I know some of the temperatures you were showing. And I kept thinking, why are they both wearing trousers? What on earth are these gents doing? And then obviously you, you think about snakes and scorpions and things running up your leg. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, um, we, we had talked about this a, a little before, but the uh, sound guy we had literally dressed head to toe in coverage he had gloves on he had long sleeve shirt he had a ski mask that you know <laughs> just his eyes were and then he had sunglasses on that big floppy hat like every you, the the thing is you want to keep the sun off your skin so it's actually better to wear long clothing and um make sure that there's not much exposed if you can at least during the day you know, those hats we had on, they weren't just a fashion choice. Those were keeping us alive. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, a fine repertoire of hats. You know, <laughs> we did have a lot of hats in there, didn't we? <laughs> Going into the actual, the various kinds of phenomena in the film itself, I was really surprised by the breadth of it. You know, you have everything from, you know, from standard sort of, quote, you know, ghost stories, white ladies, to giant skeletons with, with flame in their chest, to UFOs. And, and of course, then there is the Sandman, which is their equivalent of, of a Yeti or a, or a Bigfoot, which I am fascinated by. Because, I mean, as you know, to be in the desert it is to not see much in the way of life above, any, above a lizard. But obviously people are seeing these things. So it, it just calls so much of it into question. You wonder how can something like that live out there? But obviously something is because people are seeing things. That that was our thought going into it too. Uh, like how how in the world could some, especially a hairy hominid known for being hairy, you know, uh, how, how does something like that survive in a desert? And so we talked to some folks. We talked to a biologist. We talked to a botanist. And the one guy, Jim Dice, uh, out there is a, uh, um, a botanist. He he told us about all the different things you can eat if you know what you're looking for, um, where to find sustenance and water, things like that. And then uh, Derek can follow up uh, on this, but there was the, as he mentioned before, the elevation aspect, which led to some pretty interesting finds. Derek, do you want to pick that up? Yeah, yeah. You know, we were looking at these Sasquatch sightings out there, the, the Borrego Sandman, as they call them there. And we were kind of plotting these sightings that, that we'd recorded. And what we noticed is that if the sighting occurred in the wintertime, then it happened down lower in the, in the lower desert region, the basin. And if it happened in the summertime, the, the dry, warm parts of the year, it was way up high, 8,000, 9,000 feet, something like that which to us suggested that if this creature exists out there, it probably migrates 
in a, in a circle just every fall and spring or every fall and winter it heads uh, down to the desert floor and then in the summer and spring it heads on up to the cooler temperatures and once we made that discovery i think david and i both kind of looked at each other like this thing suddenly just became a lot more plausible because i think before that we both kind of had the idea that a lot of people do you know something like this couldn't survive out here it's it's arid it's desolate there's not a lot to eat there's nothing to drink but uh, that evidence mixed with, you know, the information we got from the botanist and the biologist and that sort of thing, uh, it, it changed my mind a little bit. I, I'm not certain which way I fall, but uh, the needle moved a little bit for me at least. And you think it's the little things like that that sometimes take it away from people just telling tall tales? Because to have that kind of nuance to the, to the prediction of the sightings gives it a bit more credence. Like you say, there, it seems to show some kind of migratory pattern, which... If people were, were making things up or just trying to add to another story and, and insert themselves into some kind of phenomenon, th they'd miss these little things. People would be seeing it in the wrong places at the wrong time of year. So sure enough, like you guys were saying, that probably made it seem far more credible than you, you went into this. Oh, yeah. That adds context to it, which a lot of stories don't have. Like that's their... I don't know, death blow, you know, for, for things like that, especially when you think critically about these things. If those little details don't add up, then it just kind of kills that credibility. And so this lends credibility to, um, you know, the, the, this idea that something like that can live out there. It, I'm not saying that it completely um, 100% verifies that something's out there, but it does, it is in the um, uh, evidence pile for it that, you know, it lends that credibility. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was sort of synchronistic timing to watch the film when we did, because we started our new season for the show with the story of Blue Eyes from Edwards Air Force Base. And of course, that was a large, you know, bear type creature that smashed down the fence and, and messed up the Mars radio station on the base. And I remember we were talking about it and it, it seemed so unlikely, you know, because as you say, when you're out there, where the hell does something like that go? But knowing that you plotted this out, it again, completely uh, sort of upended my expectations of these things. And I, I love to tease Paul that Bigfoot is an alien, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, this might be the final nail on that in my particular theory. So that's, that's fine. And, you know, Southern California has kind of been a Bigfoot hotspot for a long time and people don't realize that. And it's been my theory that, you know, it kind of peaked in the 60s, 70s, maybe early 80s. And the cities are just encroaching. L.A. is basically the size of a small country at this point out here. So it, the further it gets out into the wilderness, the less, you know, these sightings take place. They're driving whatever these things are out of there. But there are a few places left over, like the Borrego Triangle, where these things can kind of just disappear and they're not going to be messed with. You know, there's not people tromping around out there. Uh, there's a lot of Air Force bases around here with tons of, of land, you know, a huge landmass that people are not allowed on. So that's the perfect place for something like this to hide. So uh, yeah, I don't know. It's super interesting. It doesn't seem like the kind of place where Sasquatch Bigfoot could live, but the reports say otherwise. It does seem like there is something unique about the desert. I mean, Southern California, sure, but I think just the desert generally. You know, we have so many stories, of course, from the Middle East, gin and things like this, places where they're just the not just the belief, but, but the, the conviction that there is something tangible out there is, is so strong. And I'm curious, do you have any thoughts as to why this is the case, why the desert has this particular, this particular pull and this particular effect on people? For me, it's a couple different reasons. Uh, one, you know, there, nothing disappears in the desert. You park a car out there, that thing's going to be there hundreds of years from now. It's not going to deteriorate. It just kind of sits there in the heat and bakes. Uh, so, you know, anything that's ever happened in the desert's there. So we have rock art, we have that kind of thing. Derek says that, but there is uh, a, literally a lost <laughs> ship in the desert that we almost put in the film. Yes. <laughs> that completely is missing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that got buried, I guess, for the legend. <laughs> Uh, to, to fill everybody in, there was a Spanish galleon that came up the uh, the Gulf of uh, is it Gulf of Mexico down there the, uh, off the Baja Peninsula, and it used to go up where the Salton Sea is now. There used to be an inland sea. They came in there. I heard they were full of pearls. They you know they collected all these pearls and they were trying to find a passageway out of there or something. 
and uh, the tide receded and the ship got landlocked and the water just never came back up for them to get out. So they ended up having to walk out of there, leaving this Spanish galleon somewhere in the hillsides. And over years and years, sand blowing on it, they just kind of got buried. And legend is it's still out there somewhere. I, you know, it's interesting. You bring up a, a good point there, Brennan, where, where the there's speaking of uh, uh, Middle East and, and gin and things like that is what I'm, what I'm referring to. Back in the old days, the uh, the ancient civilizations like Egyptian civilization, the uh, Babylonian, Sumerian, even, even with the different cultures. Uh, I, I had just looked at this uh, a few months ago, actually, for an episode, how they considered the desert and, and evil spirits um, or what we would consider demons now. Those types of entities inhabited a lot of uh, desolate places and dark caves and ruins and things like that, just places where everything's laid bare and, and just kind of run down, crumbling. I just wonder if um, with, you know, like the Zoroastrian teachings and um, teachings of the Egyptian pantheon, things like that, if, if that kind of has carried over through millennia, uh, this idea that those types of places are dangerous, uh, they're to be avoided, there are different malevolent things lurking in the shadows there. Like, you know, you could make an argument that that, uh, that kind of thought, maybe a, a, a very instinctual fear, uh, has carried through the millennia, um, and that's why the desert in particular could be something that, you know, has some kind of mystique about it naturally, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, that could very well be. I know I, I find myself drawn to Los Angeles, and, and I, I don't know why, because it, it is expensive and, and loud, and getting anywhere is a giant pain in the ass. But regardless, I find myself drawn there. Nailed it. <laughs> but what I've noticed is, especially downtown, if you're downtown at, at night, past, say, 8 o'clock, you start to, it's almost like you feel that the inhabitable areas of the city start to start to retract. And, and part of me always wonders um, if, it, if that's got something to do with the fact that so much of that place is just built over top of the desert. And I, and I know someone once, once said to me that they felt like there is something in Los Angeles, underneath Los Angeles, just waiting for the opportunity to take its, to take its domain back, essentially. The lizard people, that's, that's the rumor that there's a whole civilization of lizard people under LA. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we hold those <laughs> truths to be self-evident, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Derek, Derek you, you can just call them what they are, Dodgers fans. <laughs> <laughs> Rams fans for me. I'm a football guy, but yeah, same deal. <laughs> but it, it, yeah, I guess just what I'm saying is it, it seems like a very, like a very special place, even even in the places where civilization has encroached, because I, I just feel like you can't change the desert, no matter what you try. You can build on top of it, you can develop it, but I, I feel like at its heart, it's still, it's still the place it is. You know, it might not just be underneath, it might be on the outskirts of town as well, because, you know, once you hit the edge of LA or the suburbs of LA, it's, it's, in, it's almost an instant line with wilderness. I mean, we push and push and then that's the line, and we push again, then that's the line. But there's always a point somewhere where the city butts right up against some some nature somewhere, and you know if you're if you're in L.A. proper, Hollywood, that area, you have the hills, which mountain lions, coyotes, bears, all kinds of things live up there. Who knows what else? Uh, so nature is certainly a part of the city there, and you know if the natural is part of the cityscape, then perhaps the supernatural is as well. Yeah, I, I remember having a conversation with one of the door guys at the comedy store. And he was telling me that one night on his way back to the car after his shift, he was surrounded by coyotes. <laughs> and it was only the fact that a, another car happened to come along uh, that he was able to get into his car and, and lock the door. But I thought, Jesus, uh, you know, that's, that's a sunset strip right there. But you, you walk, you know, a couple blocks off it up into the hills to get your car. And, and all of a sudden you're in a completely different, completely different situation. Uh, you're, in a, you're part of the food chain at that point. Once you go outside at night, you, you become part of that food chain. Yeah, even more so than everywhere else in L.A. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> different food that's chain. A, yeah, right? that's a different food chain. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to know, gents, which came first? Because obviously when you film a documentary, it's sometimes not, when it's released, it's not in the chronological order that it was filmed in. Which came first? The, the military helicopter flybys or the discovery of the security fence at Dead Man's Hall? I think the helicopters were from day one. They were just always present. I don't, David, do you remember what day we went to the 
Dead, Dead Man Hole area? Oh, man, I can't remember. We had two different shoots, um, and they were probably about a month apart. I can't remember which one we did the Dead Man Hole thing is, but every time we were out there, it was like, we'd just be driving, here's some helicopters, and, and some helicopters that like made us pull over. Well, they didn't make us pull over, but we pulled over because they were so close and they were kind of circling. And then we were like, should we film this? <laughs> like, are we going to get shot? <laughs> um, but it was about every, uh, I, I think at least every day we would see some kind of aircraft, helicopters, or um, uh, something weird flying, flying by. A lot of ospreys to uh, transport things, things, stuff like that. It, it seems peculiar because with the greatest respect, you know, you're just a, a film crew just looking into the paranormality of it all. It wasn't like you were you were butting up close and, and sort of pushing your look like some people do around Area 51, gents. You were, you know, you were in vast expanses of land. Do you suspect that it's it's one of those things that there might be sensors out there even that we may not be aware of that, that trips out, that there could be something that they don't want people to kind of stumble across? And that's why they were coming up, because I, I find it odd that they seem to buzz you for 13 days when you were just filming a documentary about strange creatures and legends. You weren't talking about secret military tech and trying to break in somewhere. There were several instances where we were miles from the closest paved road. I don't think there was a human within 20 miles of us at some of these places. And we would hear the rumble. And suddenly this thing would come flying out to our area, circle us a couple times, and then fly away. We were literally the only thing out there in, in the desert that you could see within the expanse. So to answer your question, I had the same suspicion. Like, are they? Do they have listening devices? Do they know that we're doing something like this? Do so they want to mess with us? Uh, are we getting too close to something? Uh, there was a lot of questions that went through my head. I don't know the answer to any of them, but uh, the same thoughts you know, rattled around my brain as well. I know the, uh, the small town I grew up in, there is a, a former tuberculosis colony about two and a half hours away. It was an entire town on the lake, and it's been abandoned for a number of years, uh, but then a, a small group of, of investors bought the place probably about 20 years ago. People used to love to break in there because there's, there's underground tunnels. It's really your, your whole play set for you know, the budding urban explorer uh, slash ghost story enthusiast. But once these guys bought it, uh, took it over, and this is not like a, a cabal of people. This is just a group of, of local investors. They installed fairly sensitive uh, detection equipment. So I remember one time we, we snuck up there and we got stopped right at the gate before, you know, we, we had no intention of even going in, but these guys in the middle of the night were on us in a second. So I have to imagine if private enterprise in, you know, small town Canada is that equipped 20 years ago, that now they must, the, the U S military must be using things that would, would boggle our mind in, in terms of intruder detection. One of the things I was really, really wanted to focus on was the, the number of, of UAP or UFO sightings. But there was one that, that really caught my eye. And it was the, again, the large, there's a large triangular craft that was reported. And I, I wonder uh, if you guys, without giving too much away, obviously we want people to check out the film. I wonder if you guys could just talk a little bit ab about that experience. Yeah, I mean, we, we hear these stories all the time where people are driving. A lot of times it's out in the desert. And they see a bright light off in the distance. Uh, sometimes it's in the mirror. Sometimes it's in your windshield. But as you're driving, the light gets brighter, 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 until suddenly you realize it's some sort of structure in the sky. And as you get underneath this thing, you kind of see three points of light in this middle uh, beam of light, I guess, if you will. And it's evident that it's some sort of triangle, some sort of delta shape. And on my podcast, I've had probably hundreds of these reports uh, throughout the world, not just here in California or even the U.S., just everywhere. And, uh, you know, there's plenty of, of famous sightings, the, the Phoenix Lights, there was a flap in southern Illinois, Belgium, uh, there's a bunch of places that have these flying delta uh, UFO reports. And of course, you know, the Borrego Triangle is no exception, they, they have those as well. And, you know, what's crazy about that is, and this didn't make the film, but uh, we're, we're happy to talk about it. We were driving back late one night from a shoot, and we come over the ridge, and suddenly there's five or six orange balls of light, humongous, I mean, city-sized balls of light, it looks like, because they're like 10, 15, 20 miles away, and we can see these things plain as day. 
and they're reflecting off of the Salton Sea, which I think we determined was like 30 miles from where we were standing. So they had to have been at least that far. Uh, so we don't know what these things were. We got out. We did not have the equipment to film them. We did catch it on camera. It's not impressive whatsoever. It was much more impressive in person. But these fireballs just seemed to, to hover there in the air, and it looked very reminiscent of these Delta craft that people are reporting. And if you're familiar with the 29 Palms uh, UFO video that came out, I think last summer, it looked identical to that thing, uh, whatever this was. Now, couldn't figure out how to use the footage in the film organically. It just didn't work out. So David and I made the difficult decision, like, we're not going to use it. We're not going to put it in the film. And then a few days later, we got a phone call and we're going to use the footage. We're not legally allowed to talk about how we're going to use it yet, but you guys will see it by the end of the year. You have that really fascinating segue in the, is it the, the Blue Sun Cave with the pictographs? Yeah. So the, the Native American lore there is, you know, that goes back um, hundreds, if not thousands of years. And of course, we make the point that you can't really... Um, interpret what you're seeing, you know, 100% with 100% accuracy. It's all in the um, eye or hands of, of the creator of the art. But uh, there's certainly a lot of stuff that you could interpret as, well, this could be a UFO or a ghost light or something, you know, some glowing light in the sky uh, that's different colors. There's blue, there's yellow, there's red that they've got, you know, on the cave walls. And then there's also spots where they have uh, these, cre they look like creatures. They're humanoid figures that look a little taller than other figures beside them. And they've got, you know, like three, um, uh, three, three fingers on each hand, or some of them look like claws. There's stuff that looks, uh, lizardy, which, you know, it's definitely could absolutely be lizards cause they're all over the place in the desert, but they're also pretty big and, um, they're, they're kind of oddly shaped in, in themselves. So, you know, there's, there's uh, a record of odd stuff that people have either been inspired by or seen or wanted to record somehow uh, out in that area. And yeah, there's, there, there, we wanted to portray that culture's experiences as well. All the cultures, there's, there's about three uh, Native American uh, peoples that were out there and have been, you know, since, you know, forever. And um, so, yeah, we wanted to bring that aspect uh, into the film as well, because we think that's very important. That also, you know, it not to argue from antiquity or anything, but it, uh, it, it leads a little cre credence to uh, some of the stuff we're talking about, especially if you interpret it <laughs> as did they see some of the stuff that we are seeing today as well and record that on the rocks and things like that. Again, I think you guys have done a great job of contributing to that historical record. I think this is, I, I think this is an important piece of paranormal lore. And uh, again, we, we commend you for making it. And something I, I wanted to say, and I, I said this to you off air, but I actually think it's important to mention here, is I have a great deal of respect for what you've done in that you chose not to punch up the drama. You chose not to falsify uh falsify phenomena or even to play up what did happen you know you, you have a couple moments where you you tried some stuff but as you've mentioned elsewhere you didn't have a lot of time to spend in those locations but again you you had the integrity to take what happened and show it as it happened and i think that is so important right now because i think one of the greatest issues facing this thing we do is there is this i think tendency among certain providers to just amp that up and i think it really invalidates valuable research that people like yourselves are doing. So again, my hat's off to you for, for maintaining your integrity and still producing a really compelling documentary. No, thank you. Yeah, we we uh, made that decision consciously, you know, because we've seen so many of these shows and, you know, things are sensationalized to the point where it's almost unbelievable. So we went into this knowing it, it may hurt us to do this, but we're going to be completely honest about what we find. That may involve debunking things that may be, uh, you know, us just not believing in certain aspects. But th the honesty there, I think, was was important, especially when we're covering a brand new area that, that really hasn't been exposed before. Yeah. And we that that also translated into um, we, we were on the fence about including some of the uh, on the site investigations, too. But we thought that was an important aspect of it. And we wanted to, you know, really 
drive home the point that we were out there looking at the stuff firsthand, trying to, you know, immerse ourselves as much as we could. And, you know, it, it led to some fun nights. Uh, there was the one at the Yaki Well where we had, uh, you know, the equipment trying to see if there's any anything that would show up on, on stuff. There was a, um, uh, a night at the looking for just Sasquatch. Of course, we probably could have taken a whole week to do just one investigation just got out there got into nature and and you know shut everything off and really really gone for it see if anything would show up because you know if if you're out there for I, I think we were two or three hours um on these uh investigations and i don't know that anything is gonna get comfortable enough to show itself at that point you know as is even with my expert whoops and uh, Derek's expert tree knocking, like, uh, <laughs> we, um, which we both practiced uh, ad nauseum the whole the whole trip until that point. Um, but you know what I mean. Like it, it's uh, we we thought it was important to include that even still, even though we we couldn't devote like you know a whole uh, number of days to each one. Like you probably should and on stuff like that. I, I thought it was such a wonderfully uh, human moment when you whipped out the fleer and you went, everything is hot here. Yeah. This is worthless. <laughs> yeah. That and that's true. Like it's like that stuff didn't, didn't work so well. Didn't pick up any real thing on the EMF. And the only thing that was weird was a temperature difference at the Yaki well. And, and that was something you could physically feel on your skin. There was a difference of temperature where the well used to be and then just walking five ten feet away from it so that was pretty cool all right well guys again thank you so much for taking the time to be here um where can everyone a find the film and then b although i can't imagine folks would need to know where to find you i must i assume they would already know where can they find you and your your shows and your various social media well, you can find the show or you can find the movie uh, rather at uh, amazon prime uh, apple tv go to bregotriangle.com and you can basically see everywhere that, that it's showing right now. And for everybody, uh, I know that you guys have a lot of listeners overseas. We're working on getting that distribution going. So give us a few months on that. And, and hopefully we'll have it in Australia, the UK, uh, a couple other places. And as far as my podcast is concerned, Monsters Among Us podcast, a call-in show about monsters, is available every Thursday wherever you get fine podcasts. You can find my uh, shows in basically the same places you can find Derek's. There's blurry photos, which I release whenever I get uh, uh, the research done on an episode. I'm also a co-host of Hysteria 51, which uh, covers all these topics with some humor. And then if you like uh, trivia, in addition to your, your spooky stuff, you can go to Quiz Quiz Bang Bang. Uh, that's just straight up trivia from me and my wife. Um, and then I've got a number of audio books out there, um, mostly uh, Bigfoot uh, narration uh, stuff, stories written by Tom Lyons about uh, Bigfoot and um, encounters reports, things like that. You can find that on Audible or Amazon. Just search my name. Very cool. I look forward to uh, you starting to work on the sequel then, gents. Now that we've cooled off some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, can't, we can't wait to get back out there. We're, we're shooting for like an August shoot date, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Schedule it for yep. March next time. Higher so. elevation, cooler time exactly. of year. Yep. <laughs> Christmas Eve or something. <laughs> yeah, let's search for Santa Claus next, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> Strange lights in the sky to slay. Uh, glowing red orb leading it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Congratulations to you both. Like I say, it's a, it's a fantastic work. And as Brennan said, all power to you for, for sticking to your guns and not trying to go past the point of entertainment than you have. And uh, I look forward to I really do hope that there's, there's more to come from this because there's clearly a lot more going on in this area than we've seen so far. Thank you. You'll see more. You'll see more at some point. Well, I look forward to it. Thanks again, gents. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you, guys. We really appreciate it. Welcome back. Thanks again to Derek Hayes and David Flora for hanging out with us. Make sure to check out Shadows in the Desert, High Strangeness in the Borrego Triangle, wherever you get your paranormal documentaries. Again, I'm not normally much for paranormal documentaries, but I, I really respected the integrity of these guys, and so I'm, I'm quite happy to say check it out. Yeah, very thought-provoking. Some really interesting stories and strange occurrences covering every aspect of the paranormal, really. So it's uh, well recommended. Yes, sir. 
And thanks to, to Canel again, who, who went in our stead to see late night with the <laughs> devil. <laughs> I know, I know I'm gonna have to pay for my own ticket like a sucker. Yeah. Hey, should have next time Sheffield has a horror film festival. Should have. All right. Just mentioning that. <laughs> Toronto's not that far away. I'll drive. Would I drive two hours to save myself 20 bucks? Okay, maybe that's pushing it. Maybe that's pushing it. I'm going there Friday night to see a 35 millimeter presentation of Joe Carnahan's NARC, but that's a birthday treat to myself. Yeah, I'm going to see Ghostbusters next week instead. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm. The reviews are not encouraging. Yeah, I don't care what reviewers think. Oh, yeah, I'm still going to go see it, but uh, yeah, the initial <laughs> word is not. Not yeah, it's not encouraging. It's, it's, some of the stuff they're saying is kind of things I was concerned that it would be, but again, I, I'm going to see it anyways. Yeah, well, people like Titanic, and that's rubbish, so who cares? <laughs> that is fair. That is fair. I also like I like Titanic. <laughs> Actually, just, just before we go, I had a funny thing happen uh, last night. So, or no, last night? Night before last. So I, I, I've I started working at this co-working space just to get me out of the house, and it's down in the town of St. Thomas. So I, I you know drive down there, I work for a while, and they close at 9. Uh, so, you know, 9 comes, you got to get the fuck out. And I left and I thought, well, I'm, I guess I'm done working for the day. Uh, well, I don't know what to do next. I'm, I don't really want to go home quite yet. And I realized, oh, it's Tuesday. Cheap tickets at the movie theater. So I, I went up to Landmark, saw what was playing, and I saw that there was this uh, Indian film called Yoda. Not not that Yoda, <laughs> sadly. <Right. laughs> but I saw that it was, I thought it said 190 minutes. And I thought, okay, well, that's uh, three hours and 10 minutes. Well, okay, that's not the longest Indian movie I've seen. That's fine. Okay, whatever. I got nothing else to do. I'll go. So I bought my ticket, went in to go see it. And it, it's an action film about a, about a hijacked airliner. So I, I'm sitting there. And at the, it, shortly after the one-hour mark, there's an intermission. And I thought, well, that's weird. They would have an intermission. It's not even the halfway point. But okay, I'll take it. Movie starts back up. Two hours and 10 minutes, it ends. They had it listed incorrectly on the website. And dude, I've never been so happy in my life. <laughs> Why do they have an intermission after an hour then? Uh, that's just a thing that is not uncommon with Indian cinema. They'll they'll do an intermission partway through. And I was thrilled. And, and not that it was a bad movie. I actually quite enjoyed it. But I just thought you know, you're, you're expecting to be sitting there for three hours and instead it's two and you think, oh, happy day. I'm going to go home and play <laughs> video games till I fall asleep. I don't think I've ever been to a single film showing that has had an intermission. Really? Ever, even when I was a kid. I don't remember one of those. Oh, I remember the Kenneth Branagh's Hamlet. That was four hours. That had an intermission. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that when I was 13 in theaters. Uh, what else? Uh, uh, yeah, like uh, Animal I saw recently. That's, uh, again, from, from India. That's, that had intermission. Uh, Fighter didn't. That was the one through, like, the Indian Top Gun. That did not have an intermission. But I mean, Christ, like uh, Killers of the Flower Moon didn't have an intermission and it probably could have used one. That was like three and a half hours long. Yeah, I've watched, I've watched Big Bills where I've seen, I've, I've, I saw the first three Star Wars films in one sitting um, and that only had breaks between the films. Um, first four Rockies. Oh, wow. That's a haul. Um, uh, the director's cuts of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Right. That was uh, 11 hours and 40 minutes. I've I've done that with friends. I've never done it in a cinema, but I've done it at home. Yes, it was marvelous. I did I did actually by the end of it think I'd turned into Saruman. <laughs> uh... Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> Good lord! <laughs> Remember the last time we tried to do that? It was it was years ago now. But w with the one friend who was going to come, he kept pushing it back and saying, "Ah, oh, I got to come a little bit later. I got to come a little bit later." And by the time he fucking turned up, it was. I want to say something like four or five in the afternoon. I thought, are you kidding me? This thing is 12 hours long. I don't want you in my house till five in the goddamn morning. <laughs> by, the, by the time he turned up, Helm's Deep had fallen. Yeah, yeah, you're not kidding. I was waiting for the Balrog to come finish me off. No, I was, I was, it, and we never got through. I think we got through maybe two and then everyone was kind of sick of each other and, and that was the end of it because he was that kind of guy. He was always turning up late to shit and, and driving everyone crazy. We always, we always used to have a friend like that, and we'd always tell him we were meeting half an hour earlier than we would be because he was always half an hour late. So if we told him that, he'd turn up on time. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, that's probably what we should have done. But, uh, you know, you live and you learn. You guys can't hear. Paul's on mute because his cat is just... See, speaking of Helm's Deep, his cat is sieging the room in which we're recording. <laughs> Bear in mind, for 90 minutes, we did the live show. For patrons, the cat's nothing. Not a sausage. No 
fucks given the second we start recording for talk spooky they're they're hitting the door like paul is hiding drugs and they're the cops <laughs> i did an interview last night I was on the phone for two hours nothing not a sausage yeah. it's your voice <laughs> only ever happens on a thursday any other time during the week nothing doesn't do it i did three shows last week and the only time it happened was thursday it's a gift and a curse Dulcet Canadian tones emanating through the frequency of the house. All right, my friend, where can everyone find you online? You can find Mysteries and Monsters across all social media networks and podcast sites. Fabulous. I'm at Larger the Truth on Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky, Letterboxd, and God damn it, I'm back on Twitter. I'm back on Twitter. I hate myself for it, Paul, but I'm back on Twitter. So you can find me there as Largely the Truth as well. I've left it behind. I had, a, as of last July, I, I was no longer on Twitter, and then I was looking at it, and someone was bitching about something, and I thought, yes, I also want to bitch about this, because that's what Twitter's for, and so I broke my, my Twitter <laughs> sabbatical. No, I've, I've moved on. Good. One of us has to. <laughs> as always, we like to end Talk Spooky with a song, and on this episode, we are very proud to present the latest single from Nakatomi Freefall. And of Ooh. course, we've played, yeah, and we, we've played Nakatomi Freefall on this show before, but this is their first release as part of our record label, Night Harvest Recordings. So the track is called The Other Side. It is from their brand new album, Can't Find the Words, which you can find on streaming platforms everywhere. We will be back next week with episode 185. And until then, we will leave you with Nakatomi Freefall and The Other Side.